Beneath the calm waters of Singapore, a $200 billion secret is rising. The world's largest artificial islands, built to save a nation where a third of the land could vanish this century. As sand barges work quietly offshore, the true scale and stakes remain hidden from most of the world. Why would one of Asia's richest countries gamble its entire future on a man-made coastline, and what will it take to hold back the sea? Singapore's entire nation fits into just 734 square kilometers, a footprint smaller than New York City. Yet nearly 6 million people call this island home, making it one of the most crowded places on the planet. Every square meter is precious. High-rise apartments, expressways, and reservoirs press against the edge of the sea, with little room left to expand. But the pressure is mounting. Demographers warn that Singapore's population could keep rising, even as available land shrinks. The Public Utilities Board, responsible for water and flood management, faces a dilemma. 30% of Singapore sits less than 5 meters above sea level. By 2100, climate models predict that rising seas could swallow a third of the country's land. Maps of future flood zones reveal entire neighborhoods at risk, from Marine Parade to Changi. For many residents, the threat is no longer abstract. King tides now push seawater into drains and parks during heavy rains. The city's planners have raised minimum building heights, but even these measures may not be enough. As space runs out and the ocean creeps closer, Singapore confronts a hard truth. Survival means finding new ground where none exists. The urgency is not just about growth or prosperity, but about defending a nation's very existence against forces it cannot control. Cartographers at the Public Utilities Board have spent years analyzing Singapore's vulnerable coastline, searching for a practical line of defense. Their solution begins just offshore, where the city's eastern edge meets the sea. The plan calls for four new islands, stretching in a gentle arc from the mouth of Badok Canal to the edge of Tana Mera Coast Road. Each segment sits 300 to 600 meters from the existing shore, forming a continuous barrier that will eventually add over 15 kilometers to Singapore's coastline. Geospatial mapping overlays reveal the intended footprint, a chain of land masses, each separated by sluice gates and water plazas, enclosing a new freshwater reservoir between the islands and the main city. The total reclaimed area is set at 800 hectares, roughly the size of 11 central parks, divided into three main sectors with strategic land bridges connecting back to the mainland at Badok, Marine Parade, and Tana Mera. The western anchor sits near 1.3080 degrees north, 103.9282 degrees east. The eastern tip reaches toward 1.3203 north, 103.9723 east. Satellite images already show clusters of dredging vessels and survey buoys marking the corridor, evidence of pre-construction activity. The selected corridor avoids major shipping lanes and stays outside Singapore's protected marine parks, but runs parallel to some of the country's most densely used urban beaches and parkland. The PUB's rationale is clear. By building the islands just offshore, Singapore creates both a physical buffer against the rising sea and a blank canvas for future city planning. As feasibility studies move forward, every coordinate and contour is being refined, but the vision remains fixed. A new, engineered coastline, mapped with precision, designed to defend and to endure. Construction on Singapore's Long Island begins with a feat of heavy civil engineering rarely seen at this scale. Contractors deploy fleets of dredges and barges just offshore, where the seabed drops away to depths of up to 15 meters. The first step is to stabilize the soft marine clay below, an unstable foundation that, left untreated, would buckle under the weight of new land. Using deep cement mixing, engineers inject columns of cement slurry as far as 40 meters beneath the seabed. These columns form a rigid grid, locking the ground in place and preventing settlement. Above this layer, a vast volume of fill material, over 400 million cubic meters, is pumped in, layer by layer. This fill, a mixture of imported sand, recycled construction waste, and experimental claycrete, slowly rises above the waterline, reshaping the map in real time. To hold back the sea, contractors assemble a continuous sea wall up to six meters high. 
Precast concrete caissons, each weighing thousands of tons, are floated into position and sunk into place, forming the backbone of the new shoreline. Where the islands curve toward the city, land bridges and utility tunnels are embedded, ready to connect future neighborhoods and infrastructure. Every stage is monitored by sensors and automated survey drones, measuring settlement, water flow, and structural integrity. The scale is immense. 800 hectares of new territory, engineered to last for generations. For the teams on site, the work is relentless. Shifts run day and night as Singapore's coastline is remade by machine and human effort, one cubic meter at a time. Financing the Long Island project requires a strategy as ambitious as the engineering itself. The Ministry of Finance has committed to a 30-year funding window with a projected budget of 200 billion Singapore dollars, making this one of the largest national infrastructure investments ever attempted. Instead of relying on a single funding source, Singapore is drawing from its sovereign reserves, with Temasek Holdings and GIC playing key roles as long-term stewards of public wealth. Senior finance officials describe the outlay as a form of national insurance, essential to keep the city above water and preserve economic stability for future generations. To spread risk and attract outside capital, Singapore is issuing green bonds, government debt instruments tied to climate adaptation and sustainability goals. These bonds appeal to global investors seeking both returns and environmental impact, and they help anchor the project's credentials as a model for climate finance. The government expects that, over time, private investment and follow-on development could channel trillions more into the local economy, multiplying the initial outlay many times over. The social contract is central to the plan. The reclaimed land is earmarked for more than just flood defense, housing for up to 1.5 million new residents, new parks, and expanded industrial and logistics zones. The promise is not only protection from rising seas, but also new opportunities jobs in construction, engineering, and urban services, and the creation of neighborhoods designed for a future Singapore. While some estimates suggest hundreds of thousands of jobs could be generated over the project's lifetime, officials caution that detailed employment figures will depend on how each phase unfolds and how global economic conditions evolve. What is clear is that the scale of investment reflects a commitment to resilience, prosperity, and social stability all woven into the fabric of Singapore's next chapter. Regional sand bands have squeezed Singapore's supply lines at the worst possible moment. For decades, Indonesia and Malaysia shipped millions of tons of sand to feed the city's expansion. That changed after 2007, when both countries imposed strict export restrictions, citing the destruction of riverbeds, mangroves, and even the loss of entire islands. Marine biologists now warn that the Long Island project could push fragile habitats to the brink. Coral reefs and seagrass beds near Tanamera and East Coast Park face smothering from sediment plumes. Endangered hawksbill turtles nest along these shores, while juvenile fish depend on nursery grounds threatened by dredging. The government insists that new islands will include green corridors and tidal lagoons, but scientists remain cautious. To ease the strain, Local universities are testing claycrete, a binder made from marine clay and industrial byproducts, to reduce dependence on imported sand. Early trials show promise, but scaling up remains a challenge. Sensor arrays now span the length of the new coastline, feeding real-time data to digital dashboards deep inside government offices. These instruments track oxygen, sediment, and marine life but also watch for signs of stress that could hint at deeper trouble. Public debate has grown sharper as details surface about how much of the reclaimed land will be used for housing, how much for industry, and how much set aside for national defense. Critics question whether even the most advanced monitoring can outpace the uncertainties of climate change. If sea levels rise faster than models predict, or if key defense corridors take precedence over public needs, the entire project could face hard choices. For all the technology in place, the future remains unsettled. Can a city truly engineer its way to safety, or is the risk simply being shifted further down the line?
Singapore has expanded its land area by over 20% since independence, but now faces the threat of losing a third of its territory to rising seas by the year 2100. The Long Island project, costing up to 200 billion Singapore dollars, marks the country's largest engineering effort yet, aiming to build four new islands, 800 hectares of new land, and 15 kilometers of coastal defenses. Satellite images and government documents confirm that early reclamation is underway, funded by sovereign reserves and green bonds. Yet crucial details, like the precise impact on marine habitats and the long-term availability of sand, remain uncertain, as many technical and environmental studies are not fully public. What is clear? Singapore's approach combines urgent adaptation with massive innovation, setting a precedent for coastal cities worldwide. The future of these artificial islands will define not just Singapore's shoreline, but the global response to a rising sea.